You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. You, you feel this, this nervousness on the phone there? Sir, I've been trying to make an urgent phone call up there. Well, I don't think it's something I want to do on an overseas phone. You gotta make some phone calls. Hang up the phone. Prank caller. Prank caller. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Packernet After Dark. This is the call in show of the Packernet Podcast Network. If you'd like to call in, if you'd like to participate in the show, please feel free to do so. The phone number here is 608 501 0718. New callers go directly to the front of the line. Um, we don't have any new callers today, and thank you to everybody for getting the calls in. Um, decided not to do one last night because we were a little bit shy. I probably could have done it, but you just never know if if I don't have a lot to say and I'm flying through, sometimes we can get through, you know, a lot of calls and um, having like seven ish is kind of the bare minimum. I just decided not to. So keep those calls coming in and uh, we're up to 14 right now. We'll see how many we can get done today. But let's get started with uh, Steve in Alaska. Hey, Ryan. How's it going, man? Steve yeah. up in Alaska. Just sitting inside, doing a little bit of work around the house on a relatively chilly day. We've had a bit of a cold stretch. We got down in the negative 20s and 30s here for a couple of weeks. But it's supposed to be warming up here, you know, the positive range. So, you know, it'll get better. But I'm calling in because uh, I've been listening to everybody calling in on the Packing That Podcast here and talking about the Joe Barry firing. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand why everybody's being so mopey because I, I, in my memory, remember a year and a half, this year, yeah, about a year and a half of nothing but fire the guy, fire the guy, fire the guy, fire the guy. <laughs> and now that he's been fired, everybody's like, oh, you know, I, I feel so bad for the guy. You know, he, well, everybody made me feel bad because everybody was upset about the game. And I was like, well, I can't wait until we get to the Joe Barry news. Everyone's going to be jumping up and down and excited and happy and that everyone's sad and i'm like well fine i guess i'm a jerk he really did try it it it, it, it sounds to me like an old south park skit they took your job with all the all the redness and every time somebody gets fired oh, they yeah. all get together they took they took your job. <laughs> well, what are we doing here people <laughs> we want to be better if we're going to be better that means that we're going to have to get rid of the people that are holding us back and he was a guy that was holding us back this is sports this is how this works. And, Ryan, I heard you talking about it, and I was saying it, too. He's made millions of dollars. Yeah, he'll be all right. So what are you crying about? I'll tell you right now, somebody just dropped 2 $3 million on me and, and said, here's a job, you're going to go do it, but we're going to fire you at the end. I'm taking the job. I'm going to take those 2 $3 million, and I'm going to get fired, and I'm going to be happy for it. Because why I got $2 $3 million? I should be able to sustain me and my family for the foreseeable future. Unless I'm stupid with it, <laughs> I'm a complete idiot with it, I can take care of my family. So I don't feel bad for the guy because he didn't do the job well enough to keep the job. Right. And if any of us are working money. a job anywhere else out there in the world where we're getting paid twenty, thirty, forty dollars an hour, if we're not doing well enough to keep our job, they'll get rid of us and put somebody else there. Especially if that person will come in and work for cheaper. So <laughs> well, and 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 especially in a highly competitive environment, right? You you got people that don't work in those kinds of environments, and they're like, "Well, I you know I know tons of people that don't do their job very well, and they don't get fired." First of all, assuming you're not that person, you probably complain about it. Okay, so that's number one, and number two, it's different at the top. If you're talking about a job that fifty thousand people can do, and a lot of them are not the greatest workers in the world, and you're just kind of happy to have somebody there, that's one thing. If you're talking about some of the most highly competitive enterprises, you talk about CEOs and, and all these kinds of things, um, there's there's different expectations. And so, yeah, I mean, it's it's no different with the players. It's no different with coaches, head coaches, and defensive coordinators and that kind of stuff. It's very highly competitive, and you're getting a lot of compensation. And if companies are going to pour, I mean, again, it's one thing for a company to pour like 
22 bucks an hour into somebody where it's probably going to cost you more money to fire them than it is to just let them keep doing their job sub in a subpar manner. Um, but if you're talking, you know, millions of dollars every single year and you're, they are a massive representation of your success or failure, again, as opposed to like the guy that's, you know, sweeping the floor somewhere or whatever, where the the success of the team isn't really reliant on that guy, maybe not doing the best job of cleaning the bathrooms. Yeah, you you there's a much higher scrutiny. And if we're going to be paying somebody two, three, four million dollars, however much we're paying a defensive coordinator, we're gonna make sure that it's absolutely the right person for the job. And we all agree that Joe Barry wasn't the right person. Um and I think most of us agree that he is very deserving of a job that's still very high paying and and um and, you know, a linebacker's coach, I think is fantastic. Yeah, go be a linebacker's coach. I think that's great. That's where he belongs. But there are other people more deserving of the job that should be getting that pay and should be doing the job, and that's what happened. I mean, everything just is where it's supposed to be. And maybe Halfley's not the guy, and we'll find out. And guess what? He's not going to keep the job either. So, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to just be completely insensitive and just be like, it doesn't matter at all. I mean, of course, but it, it doesn't change any of the facts. It doesn't change a single thing. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just annoying to me when people get upset about it as, as, as opposed to what? So my job is to comment on it. What am I supposed to say? He should keep his job. Should I just lie and say he should keep his job? What should I say? Should I just not have an opinion because the truth is, is not nice. I just come on now. Can we freaking grow up and grow a pair for crying out loud? Let's 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 all be honest here that we got a, we got a new person in. We got to see if the new guy can do the job. Um, I'm happy about the fact that we're going to a four three. I think we stuck with the, the three four long enough, and we've had a bad defense long enough that a, a big swing and turn and change like that will be good for us. Um, it'll liven everybody up, make everybody have to figure themselves out. Otherwise, they're going to get fired, and we'll bring in new people. Cause that's how the NFL works. So, uh, nobody took nobody's job. He'll, he'll go out and do his thing and he'll be fine and he'll still have more money than probably 99% of the people that call into this show. All right, Packers, let's take it easy. Bye. Yep. I'm in, I'm in agreement. I, you know, I don't know. I've, I've said all I needed to say. So Seth or Seth, Seth is the new caller. Steve, thanks for calling. Hey Ryan, it's Hey. Hopefully you can hear me. I, I can now. Um, have a little noise in the background, but um, I just wanted to. I meant to actually call in about this a while ago, and I just saw someone's tweet that reminded me of it, and it was basically an identical situation. So we moved them from their current teams. Would you rather have Jordan Love or CJ Stroud? Mm-hmm. I meant to call in after the season on this because I watched the Texans playoff game. Um, there's another game I watched. Um, it was a Lions Bucks game, maybe. But, um, I would definitely take Love over Stroud. And that's not a knock Stroud. He's, he's a good quarterback. He's a young quarterback. But the thing I've noticed about Love, especially the second, by the way, when people talk about Love was amazing from week nine on, that's over half the season. That's nine games based on the Packers bye week was. So, NA was consistent that last nine weeks for the most part. Um, but anyway, the thing that, I mean, we all know that Love has like crazy arm strength and really good physical attributes and a lot better than some other quarterbacks. And, um, I think that's true. But the thing that's impressed me the most about Love is his ability to read the defense, his spokes, his, uh, pre-snap adjustments. I mean, I'm watching other quarterbacks and I'm not finding many that are better. I mean, even of the vet guys, but definitely compared to the young guys. I mean, CJ Stroud, I watched that Texans, uh, Texans Ravens game. He didn't make very many adjustments at all and they got smoked and it was evident that he was not ready for what the Ravens defense threw at him. I think, uh, you know, love, well, we didn't beat the Niners. He, he even played decent against the Niners other than his two picks and it was a rainy game. But especially if you take that game out of it, I mean, just the way he reads defenses, um, flashback to the Cowboys game when he, he, uh, did a fake, you know, the snap count, he didn't actually hike it, but the Cowboys thought it was going to, he saw the blitz come and he adjusted. 
Yeah, audible out. Then he threw like a 30 yard ish touchdown pass to Wicks on his uh, adjustment. But that's just really impressed me. His uh, ability to read the defense, read it quickly, make adjustments. And I think that's really where he's starting to stand above some of the other young guys in the league. But, anyways, just some thoughts. Um, love to hear what your comments are. All right, bye. Oh, boy. Well, I mean, we got to start from the standpoint of I think both teams should be really happy with their situation. And I think if I was given the actual option to switch, would I? I think the answer would be no, but I think a lot of that is just my bias and the fact that I'm just all in on him. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Jordan Love. I really like him. I want him to be a Packer. Um, it would just be hard for me to, to just, it would just be hard for me to do that because I'm, I'm bought in. Like I'm, I'm invested in, in him as a person and as a part of our locker room and all that stuff. Leaving all of that aside, I think it's it's a real struggle in an uphill battle to pick Jordan over Stroud. Um, I mean, they both ended with nearly identical PFF grades, 83.1 and 83.6 for Jordan. So he was just barely higher. Um, they were both similar in that they, they were kind of streaky, right? CJ Stroud got an earlier start, but it was like uh, he had a three games. So he had two rough games and then he had a three game stretch where he was really good. Then he was bad for two games, and he had a four-game stretch. Then he was bad for three games, and he had a two-game stretch, and then he ended with a mediocre game. I say bad because, you know, let's say 60s or lower. It doesn't necessarily have to be bad. In fact, if anything below a 50, between Stroud and Jordan Love, there was one game, and it was Stroud. It was it was against the Jets. Was his only That was the only, like, bad game between the two of them. Um, but Jordan was similar, but obviously he had an eight-game stretch where it just it was, you know, we'll say bad. It was mostly 60s. Then he had two good games, and then he was off. Then two good games, and then he had two off. And then four good games, and then one of his worst games of the year came against San Francisco. So they're both similar in that way. I think there's a couple things that would lead me towards Stroud. Number one, obviously, is the age difference, 22 compared to 25. The other is that we've seen some of the negatives from Jordan. We haven't seen any negatives from Stroud. So when you look at it and say, you know, was it a fluke? It just, Jordan makes me more nervous because you don't want to see a reversion back to what we've seen in previous years or even in the first half of the year where he's mostly just kind of not super great. Um, on top of that, Jordan has less like good games than C.J. Stroud. Stroud has, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Jordan has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, is it? Wait, wait. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's only one less game. But it it's it's more like elite games. So it just it makes me feel like if anybody's gonna have a slight regression, it feels more like Jordan. He's had, you know, less overall good games. Mostly the the good is like mega elite. And so it's it's hard to imagine that that is it feels less sustainable. Um and then you just look at the draft position. C.J. Stroud, in his rookie, actual rookie year, number two selection, comes out and lights up the league. Jordan Love was a late first-round pick, looked to be quite bad, and then this year kind of picked it up down the stretch with like three individual patches of good games. I'm not trying to downplay Jordan. I'm just, I'm just saying if I was completely removed from the situation and we were starting a new team and I was like a – a Ravens fan, and we were getting a new quarterback, and I can pick Jordan Love or C.J. Stroud, I would probably have to pick C.J. Stroud. Um, but Jordan Love would also be a fantastic pick and somebody that I'd be very excited about picking. I just think objectively it's really hard to go against C.J. Stroud. Um, but they are extremely similar in how things went, and I'm really looking forward to these two kind of leading the charge and being, you know, hopefully instead of... Chiefs 49ers, we start seeing more Texans Packers as the uh, the rivalry of the future. Hey, Ryan. Pac Man, Hey. Um, hopefully, by the time you hear this, this isn't old news about the uh, Joe Barry experience. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm listening to a lot of people sad that Joe Barry got fired. I can't honestly say that I was on that boat. I think the guy maybe should have got fired, even though it's sad. You know, the NFL still is a business, and uh, if you're not doing your job, you got to get the boot. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, 
looking very forward to uh, this new guy, Jeff Hasley. I honestly can't say I, I know who this guy is. I mean, I watched a couple Boston College games and stuff like that, you know, throughout the year, but uh, whatever. It, 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 he's somebody on his resume that I was kind of hoping for, like like the mirror image of, uh, you know, Matt LaFleur. Possibly. Hopefully. In in half a year, you can see some progress with these guys. I, I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, getting back to the Joe Barry thing, I, I just want to remind Packers fans that, you know, you had Mike Patton, that you didn't do anything. And the whole reason the windshield is screwed in the rear view you know, there's a reason for that. So uh let's go pack. And I'll uh keep in touch with you guys throughout the uh postseason. Go pack. Yeah, sorry about I don't know why that was so uh choppy sound. I don't know if that was on his end or my end. Hopefully the rest of the calls don't go like that, but um I, I all I can say is I'm looking forward and Pac Man Jersey Jim called and it was Sunday, so it was a little bit early. I don't know who was hired yet. But um, I said it on the podcast today, man. There's so many Jersey guys now. We got a, a defense full of Jersey guys, and we got two very well-known Jersey callers. And I expected 100% Jersey Mike to be in here just losing his mind, and we got nothing from Jersey Mike. We got nothing from Pac-Man Jersey Jim. I don't know, man. Just expected a little more pride, I guess. I don't know, I don't know what to say. Maybe Jersey Mike's been spending too much time down in Texas. Pretty soon he's going to be calling in talking about we damn boys. <laughs> I don't know why I'm being mean. Uh, why don't we take our first break? And uh, if you want to support the podcast, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy is where you can uh, do that to support. And actually, I saw some people doing it. You can actually sign up for free. Um, I don't know what the major benefit of that is because I'm not massively active. I do need to do better with that. I've been saying that for years. So people that are in there know it doesn't mean much. I try. Sometimes I do. I need to just have like a thing, like a checklist every day. Go on Patreon, check this, go here, do that. I got to do that. I just got to build a checklist. So freaking scattered. I've got, what do I have here? So I've got my Chrome is up and Chrome is for PFF. Then I have one, two, three, four, five different, um, what is this called? Windows freaking internet things, five different things each one with a bunch of tabs. So this one's got about 20 tabs in it. This one's got five tabs. This one's got about nine tabs. This one's got about six tabs. And so I just, this is, this is, I just, it's me trying to apologize to my Patreon people. I'm a scattered mess, man. I need someone to just come in here and be like, shut up and do the one thing. And that's it. You can't do other things. Get off social media because everything, it's not even like football stuff. I'm scrolling through and it's like, oh yeah, we bombed Iraq. I'm like, wait a minute. Why are we bombing Iraq now? I thought I thought we were going after Iran. Now we're going after Iraq. Is there is there a country in the Middle East we haven't drone bombed somebody? So then I go down that path for like ten minutes. I'm talking to the robot constantly, I'd be like, "Robot, why are we bombing these people?" Like, here's a bunch of articles. Tell me about it. I'm like, well, we're doing this. I'm like, well, I, but, but why? It's like, well, Hezbollah. I'm like, I thought Hezbollah was over here. They're like, oh, they're over here too. And uh, uh, and then I forgot I was doing a podcast. I think I just need medication. Probably what I need. So, uh, anyways. You can go there and and sign up if you want. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, price line. Hey, Ryan, this is Ethan from Maryville, Tennessee, man. Hey. I'm here again with another random Packer player from the past. And uh, today is the best white receiver to ever play for the Green Bay Packers. So, um, Jeff Janis. <laughs> yes. All right, back. Jeff Janis. Better than Jordy, better than all the rest, better than that. 
Freaking D-bag out in Seattle that one time, whatever his name is. Screw that guy. Jeff Janis. Where was he from again? Town out in Michigan. Tawas, Michigan, I think it was. I don't know. It's stupid things that I just remember. I wanted to get a job out there. I saw there was a job in Tawas, Michigan, and it looked really nice out there. Small little town, like on the water with a water tower thing out there. And I was like, that looks really nice. Like I'd like to live there. And then we brought in Janice, and I looked it up, and I'm like, oh, Tawas, Michigan. I know exactly where that is. That's crazy. Something like that. I could be wrong. All right. Hey, Ryan. Hey. I'm just listening to your, uh, I guess, Sunday night, Monday morning episode about the whole Aaron Rodgers saga and everything. And I'm probably only like 20 minutes in, right? I, this is like a good like vindication for us. Pack fans on like just like what Rogers like was for our franchise on how he interacted and everything, but like you know we didn't need like he could have like the trade could have went through and they could have went on and been successful and everything right and if he like never got hurt all that could have happened and like the the vindication that I got was very simple Mark Murphy. When the trade went through, he's doing an interview with somebody, and he is giddy like a child, and he's yelling, 65%. <laughs> Where's Clayton with the sound button, right? That's just, <laughs> but it's when I heard the tone in his voice, right. grown professional man <laughs> who, run, who is running one of the most successful franchises and all sports how happy he was with that trade and everything he knew about what was behind it that's all the vindication we needed because mark murphy you know he's a professional yeah he does say that they sometimes say the things he's not supposed to say and wears his heart on his sleeve and everything right but to openly just blurt out with such happiness about how good that trade was for the Green Bay Packers because of all the baggage they're sending off and everything they're potentially receiving back. And yeah, we didn't get the first round pick, but we got two second round picks with a roster that's already good. Uh, you know, that's all the vindication. That laugh, we didn't even get our 65%, but we still caught it because you know, we got Musgrave, you know, we got a pick this year, it's like Rogers was great because he did things a certain way and demanded excellence and perfection. But we're not in that generation anymore where you can win that way. You have to have the guys. And we have the guys because we decided to go the right way. So that's all I got. Go back, go. Yeah, and look, I mean, a lot of people want to kind of cast dispersions on people that um, have made comments about what's going on on the inside, people that claim to know things. And it's a question of you kind of take one of two sides because they're very specific and explicit um, comments. I'm, I'm in this case talking about Bob McGinn. But when he comes out and basically just says, like, the trade is going to happen no matter what, they will not allow him to come back. They want him gone real bad. The people in the building can't stand the freaking guy. I mean, you only have two cho- two choices. He's he's flat out lying, and he's a hack, or he's telling the truth, right? I mean, it's just the, the, those are the only two things because he's explicitly saying he knows that those people are they 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 harbor those feelings toward Rogers. Um, so if Bob McGinn is correct, then yeah, the people in that building, and I'm not speaking for everybody or his teammates or whatever. Obviously, we know David Bakhtiari loves him and and whatnot, but um, a lot of the personnel people, I think, really disliked him, really disliked the environment with him being in the, the situation. Um, and, and, you know, again, I don't think it really was his play. I think it was just his, his way of being. He was such a large entity, and he, he kept demanding things outside the scope of what quarterbacks do. You know, th- this is one of those just shut up and play football things, right? Which I know is a hated and sometimes ignorant thing to say, but, you know, in, in, a, in a sense, there's a lot of truth to it. Like, it, when we're talking football, you have a very 
confined role. And uh, Rodgers got to the point where he was so big, he didn't like that anymore. He wanted to tell everybody what to do, and he was telling the coach what to do. He's telling the GM what to do. And as a coach and as a GM, you don't like that. I mean, you know, Matt LaFleur has always been very polite, and I doubt he would ever say a bad thing about Rodgers publicly or even maybe privately, although he talked bad about our kicker privately and didn't think that that was going to get out. But, um, you know, if, if you are a young, innovative, offensive mind and your offense isn't working and it's not working partially because the freaking quarterback will not listen to what you say because he thinks he's smarter than you and he knows better than you and he condescends to you and looks down on you as being lesser than he is, there's going to be some frustration. You know, when the guy digs his heels in and he says, I'm not coming back anymore because of the way these people treat me and the way that they treat people, they treat everybody like garbage and, you know, just basically blasts Brian Gutekunst for the way he treats people and uh, demands that guys like Randall Cobb come back. Like, who's going to like that? I mean, it's, it's, it's painfully obvious that the people in the building are going to freaking hate the guy. Right? Great quarterback, but it, you, you can't run a team like this. So, yeah, I, I think that there was a lot of that. And, um, you know, there's positives and negatives to having a superstar. And I think at some point the negative just becomes they get so big they think they can control everything. And that's not going to be good because there are people already hired to do those jobs. And then you have higher ups saying we should just do it because we're scared of losing them. And it's like, this is bull crap. Like, this is absolute bull crap. That we got to be on pins and needles, needles about doing our job, not because of the fan base, but because our own freaking quarterback is going to throw us under the bus. And so, yeah, I mean, th- you're right about there's there's been plenty of forms of vindication along the way. But, you know, this just becomes one of those things where it's like if, you know, you know those people who are constantly in bad relationships and it's like, you know, all men or all women or, or this, that or the other. And it's like, well, you know, at some point, if you were smart, you'd recognize maybe it's you. If problems seem to follow you wherever you go. You know, and and all your exes seem to be finding long-standing relationships. It sounds like maybe they weren't the problem, and so the Packers seem to be coming together quite nicely. And the Jets look like what the Packers look like, with all the drama on the inside and all the breaking articles about all the stuff going on. And the, you know, and and granted, a lot of that story was the way that it was handled was awful. And it's not even necessarily like a a Rodgers thing, but it, it's just, it's the way that the team operates when you have a superstar like that. And when everybody caters to him, it's more to do with like the philosophy of how to handle these things. And and my vindication comes from the standpoint of when you have a quarterback like that and he starts telling you what to do, you say, F you, go back and throw a football or get off my team. That's what I wanted to go to Kunst to do. And when he didn't do it, it was the wrong decision. And we saw that it was the wrong decision. Our team completely flatlined. We went in the wrong direction. We moved on from Aaron Rodgers. We started going back to the old philosophy of how the Green Bay Packers build teams. And it's been going great. Draft and develop, youngest team, super talented. It's it's very, it's very simple. It's it's divide and conquer. Like we 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 have our own divisions of labor. We get the greatest people that we can to do those specific jobs. And if you can, if you can execute those things, then we're going to succeed. While the Jets are over there with this nonsense about like just fawning over the guy and doing everything he wants and bringing in these players that they never would have brought in if it wasn't for him and bringing in an offensive coordinator that's terrible at his job, but it's all about fawning over Rodgers and getting him what he wants and wooing him to the Jets. That's just not how you win. So this, this, is, this is a lesson about moving forward. If, if Jordan Love becomes a diva and starts deciding, I want my guys with me and I want you know a washed up Jaden Reed to come back and, and play slot and I want you know, you to start doing this, and, I, and I'm going to throw a fit because you drafted a quarterback because I'm 37 years old or whatever. You know, at that point, Jordan, I'm sorry. I love you. I love what you've done. Thank you so much. But we've been here. We've been here with Brett. We've been here with Rodgers. And now we've been here with you, and we know how to handle this. The best thing that happens in these situations is when the organization says no. That's when things get better. That's when things heal. Things turned around. Not when Brett Favre kept coming back and kept coming back. That the, the team was just spiraling out of control. We knew we weren't going anywhere with Brett when he was acting like that. It was when they finally put their feet down and Brett said, I want to come back. And the Packers said, nope, we're going with Rodgers. That's when things got better. And the things with the Packers, you can feel the healing happened when they sent Rodgers out and they said, no more. We're returning back to normalcy. And now things are blooming. And again, that's not necessarily to say that the Jets can't have success. They can but you're 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 it's this the amount of self sabotage is unbelievable. Stop doing it. And and unfortunately, the only way that you can actually stop doing it is you have to tell Rodgers no. 
And I don't think you can do that. I don't know if he'd even allow that. I have no idea. And, you know, I don't know how much of the blame is on Rodgers and how much is on the rest of the team. Again, obviously, this is following him. So it's it's something about just his presence in general. But here would be a very simple question. It's, it's a simple sales pitch. Rodgers, with you here, with my coaching, with this defense, and with this GM that's actually shown that he can do some stuff, granted, it's only in like top five picks, but still, he's proven that he's been able to, to, to make some moves here. We can win it. But there is a condition, and that is I'm the coach, he's the GM, that guy over there with the stupid chain around his neck, believe it or not, is the owner. We don't know what he does, but he's the guy that's the owner, and you're the quarterback, and that's how it's going to be. And this guy, freaking apparently, is the offensive coordinator, which should not have been hired. It should have been somebody better and more qualified than him, and um, they should have just sold it that way. But they didn't. And it's, it's, it's a, it was a mistake by the Jets. And if Rodgers would only accept jobs based on those conditions, then that's a problem with Rodgers because it's self-sabotage. You're not allowing yourself the opportunity to go to a winning situation and win. You have to let people do their jobs. You have to stop believing that you are the all-knowing being of the universe and that you can do everybody's job, that you are simultaneously one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play the game and also one of the greatest offensive play-calling minds and also one of the greatest GMs of all time. You're not all those things. You're one thing. And you're not a great philosopher and you're not a great this or that or the other thing. You're a great quarterback, okay? That's it. You're, you're maybe adequate in some of these other categories, but we have elite people in these positions doing these jobs, so stop trying to take their job. So again, from the macro view, this, this is my stance, and I feel vindicated in it. And this is the case with everybody. It could be a wide receiver who starts to get a little mouthy. It could be Jair, right? I mean, the, the situation that we have with Jair, everything seems fine now. But if, if things started to spiral out of control, unfortunately, yeah, maybe something would have to happen. And, and that would be my stance is pending the details, yeah, maybe it's time to move on. But it sounds like it didn't come to that. It was a little bit of a flare-up and uh, probably frustration over the defense and the team, but especially the defense playing poorly. And maybe the way that things have been handled. Again, you talked about the strength and conditioning coach and, and maybe the way some of these injuries have been handled and maybe they should were being asked to play when they shouldn't have been being asked to play. And the players were upset with that, and so they didn't trust the process, as Gutekunst said. Could be that uh, they were getting thrown under the bus a lot while the defensive coordinator coming up with bad plans was being shielded. But whatever it was, they had to sit down. Everything's good. Jair loves being a Packer. He loves being here, and we're getting ready to rock and roll. Hey, Pack Daddy. It's uh, Garrett from Southern Illinois. Sure. I thought you could use a laugh, so I would share something with you that I saw on social media. All right. Uh, it was probably from one of the NFL Facebook pages for memes, and it showed a picture of Patrick Mahomes, and his wife uh, standing in some luxury box or something, maybe at an NBA game or something. Okay. Whatever, they're both standing next to each other. And the comparison, which I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, Kermit the Frog and uh, Beaker, the assistant to the mad scientist on yeah, the Muppets. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, they made a comparison because Patrick Mahomes, when he talks, he sounds, sounds like, like Kermit, Kermit the Frog. Yeah, so yeah. they've been making fun of him and that comparison for quite a while, but... This one I thought was even more hilarious because they put a side by side. They got Kermit the Frog and Beaker, and Beaker is supposed to be his wife. Which actually, there are facial similarities there and facial expressions that are total nailed. I laughed my head off, and I was like, "We aren't haven't had any uh, laughing at the enemy." And I know how much you have a disdain for Kansas City, so I thought I would share that. Uh, Little things you can mentally see it. it, it it's it's something to behold. So look it up and see if you can find it. I'll try it. to find it if I can share it to you. But uh, I thought you needed a laugh. So I'm out. All right. Let me see if I can find this. I found it. It's TikTok, but it, at the same time, it doesn't look like an actual video. It's just different videos. I don't know if any of these are going to be right. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything. Let's see if I can just do my own side by side here. <laughs> I'm. I'm struggling to try to find a comparison between the two. There must have been a very specific picture of Taylor Swift to try to make her look like Beaker. I will say, for the record, and and again, I've talked about the Taylor Swift thing. My frustration is more the NFL handling than any... I I am not anti-Taylor Swift in any way. I don't really get it. I'm surprised that she's as popular as she is. But, you know, that's... It is what it is. Good for her. But also, like, 
in the very little bit that I've seen, and maybe it's completely fake, I have no idea, she seems like a really nice person. So I just, I have a hard time super ragging on her, especially since there's so much negativity around her all the time. It's kind of like, I don't know, dude. She's a super famous pop star billionaire that likes football and in the middle of her concert hops on a jet and flies in to come watch a Chiefs game in the box and just has fun with her friends. Like, I don't freaking care. Sounds dope. I wouldn't do that. Like, if I was a super famous billionaire and I was dating, like, some soccer player and I had to do a concert in Japan, and she was like, hey, do you think after your concert you can get on a private jet and fly back and watch me in, like, Houston play soccer? Be like, frickin' no. <laughs> I'll just watch it on TV or something as I'm passing out. Like, I'm tired, dude. I'm, I'm, I'm on the other side of the world doing a concert, bro. I'm a rock star. Are you kidding me? I'm not doing that. And I don't know, but I, I don't think she's, like, snorting lines to stay up all night. She doesn't give off that vibe, so she's just, just hardworking, putting in the hours. So, good for her. Again, I don't get the fawning, but I also don't really get the hate. And I'm not, I don't, I don't care. I mean, it's, it's fun. If, if, if you could show it to me, I'd look at it and I'd probably laugh. I'm just saying I don't see it. And again, I'm not trying to come down on you, Garrett. I'm just saying I don't want to like give off like I'm super anti Taylor Swift vibes so that all the calls come in and they're like, check out this joke about how stupid she is. It's like, all right, we don't, <laughs> we don't need to go down that path. Exactly. All right, let's take uh, another break and uh, hear from Kyle from Madison. Ryan, what is up, buddy? Sure. Kyle from Madison. How are you? I don't know. So just listen to um, After Dark. I think it was Nate was saying that um, you know he's cool with uh, with Jones and Dylan coming back, and um, I definitely agree with him on Jones. I've not not been shy about that. I'm gonna have to respectfully disagree on Dylan, though. I think. Watching that Packers offense this last year um, without Jones, to me, it just felt so different. I mean, just and I, Aaron Jones is a very gifted player, so of course it's going to be different. But I mean, I, I just didn't see AJ getting it done. I think he's good and very good actually in pass protection and does some things, but. They really need somebody that's a playmaker. And I just, I'm sorry, but I don't see that A.J. Dillon is a playmaker. Like, I I can't figure out what it is that he does well. I think he goes down very easily on contact for a guy his size. I think he's overrated as a short distance run. You understand we had some running. Well, Well, we still have run blocking issues at the line, but just the same, I feel like, an objective GM should be able to look at that performance from him and the offense. And then conversely, when Jones came back, I mean, it was like, you know, getting jet fuel, um, you know, get to fill up a jet fuel for that offense when he came back. And I just think that's a position you've got to upgrade. You need to have more of a threat um, at that RB2 spot. Which brings me to my, I guess my ultimate point here is it, it, the Packers don't have an owner, okay? We're the only team, obviously, that doesn't have an owner. And I do think that that gives us a bit of a superpower in the sense that we can sit Aaron Rodgers behind Brett Favre for three years, and we can sit Jordan Love for three years behind Aaron Rodgers. There isn't going to be an owner that comes down and starts demanding that the first-round pick plays. And that's a huge deal for us. And I think just like with, uh, was it Clement, Tom Clements, quarterback coach? They've got a protege, maybe, former quarterback from the Vikings in there. Same thing they should do with Jones. Take advantage of this unique structure we have. Get an up-and-coming running back in there to learn for a year and back up Jones and kind of have a, have a succession plan. To me, that's the move. That's our superpower, and it really, I think, would make us a lot better team going forward. Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, as far as A.J. Dillon, I mean, obviously he did have a down year. So, you know, there's questions about who is he really. But at the same time, I mean, as much as, you know, PFF has loved him in the past, it's just, it's hard to imagine. We have not seen an elite running back, even potential, since basically his first full-time game against Tennessee. 
to, to me, that was like the one time we saw him was like, bro, this can be Derrick Henry. Like, this is unbelievable. Since then, it just, I don't know. And, and you're right. I mean, the one thing you expect from him is a power back, and he's not that. I mean, he just isn't. Um, you, you occasionally see him do something. It's like, oh, there's the power. And then you watch somebody that's half his size do the exact same thing. It's like, oh, I guess everybody can kind of do that. And with his just complete lack of balance, it's like it, it ruins the whole thing about him just plowing through things that other guys can't because it's like somebody taps his ankle and he goes flying. So, you know, everything that you look at with Dylan, at least from my perspective, when I watch it, it's like, I don't know when you watch a lot of other running backs in college or anything else, it's like, okay, but if you get rid of Dylan and you bring in this guy, what is the thing you're losing? And I I agree that Dylan is a good overall back. I mean, as far as, you know, he can obviously run like all running backs can, he can pass block and he can catch. But I think most running backs can do that. Maybe not the pass blocking as much, but as far as being a receiving back, I mean, that's just automatic at this point. So I, the bottom line is I'm, I'm with you. Like I, I like Dylan and I struggle because I know PFF graded him highly and it has to be based on something. And I know he's done some good stuff and he's, he's, he's had some games and everything. I just really struggle, especially when you look around the league. Everybody has been that guy sometimes. Everybody's able to, to have a couple games here and there and do some stuff. But I just don't see the special. And the fact of the matter is you can find good running backs all throughout the draft. We might even have one on our team that was an undrafted free agent right now. I don't know. But I know there's some talented running backs. I mean, I've, I've mentioned three of them that I'm, I'm a big fan of. One of them is he's going to have to go in the second round. The other two, I don't know. They're going to be later for sure. Lauby and uh, the kid out of Kentucky, which I haven't watched him since the first time. But I know the first time I'm through, I watched them and it just something just clicked in my brain. And especially Lauby, like I said, if I had to pick a guy that was like the Aaron, Ro- Aaron Jones guy, Lauby. So you want another fifth round pick like Jones was, and he, he, you know, not necessarily sits for a year, but, you know, he's sort of the backup and can learn and can grow. Heck yeah, man. I mean, I, I, that, that's, that's been my stance from day one. And I think the Packers agree is, is you don't want to be reactive. You want to make sure that's, that's what best player available is all about is you don't know where those, those holes are going to be later. So you, you draft the best players, which doesn't seem to make sense at the time. Like, well, we already got this, that, or the other. But as time goes on, all of a sudden, there's these people are leaving. So, yeah, I mean, if they're in striking distance of a running back, they shouldn't hesitate for a second. They should strike. And I hope they do. I, I'm excited about getting uh, a couple of stud running backs to uh, pair with Aaron Jones so that we can kind of take the load off his shoulders so that he's healthy down the stretch. I think he was really good down the stretch. And I think a big part of that was he was hurt all year. So he didn't play very much. So he, he was kind of forced mandatory... Uh, rest for Aaron Jones as much as it seems counterintuitive because he was injured the whole time still I mean he's he's not running around he's not doing all that stuff so by the time he was back healthy he was able to just put it all on his shoulders and do some damage so we need a guy in there um and again I feel bad saying it about Dylan but and 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 a big part of the reason is because I don't I don't know that I'm right about Dylan I just I haven't been able to see the special I know I've been annoyed with him when I watch just the vision isn't quite there again the balance is a problem the power is not what it should be best case scenario in all these situations is Dylan just becomes that dude and we don't have to worry about it. But um, yeah, very long way of saying I agree. Hey, Kyle from Madison. What's up? So I got a question for you. I want to get your thoughts on this. I think coming into this season, you know, as you looked at the next couple of years for the Packers, if you assumed that Love was the guy, which we didn't know, but like, if you assume he was the guy, the the timetable for this team is looking like about 2025. Because that's when you get rid of the Rodgers cap, you get rid of a, a lot of dead money. I wonder how you think that, how you think the timeline has changed now with how good this team was. Because what I'm wondering is, I look at the safety class, man, I mean, I'm not sure... I mean, who knows? He might pluck a guy from the fifth round and he's a stun. But of all the positions, like, does, does Goody go free agency for safety? Um, I know it's a year early, but couldn't he just, you know, really backload that, that contract and just, just go out and pay somebody? I'm not saying necessarily, but let's just say, like, let's just say he thinks Winfield, the Tampa, former Tampa safety, like, is, is going to be the guy. You know, we know he'll do that in free agency if he thinks it would make a difference. I'm not saying necessarily that's the move, but I could see a scenario where you go pay a guy 
And then, hey, bring Savage back on the Kevin King deal, you know, on the one-year thing. I mean, <laughs> suddenly you have a really good freaking safety room. And then you add one or two other DBs in the draft. You go O-line, running back, and defensive line and linebacker with the rest of the draft, and bam, I mean, you're, you're looking good. So I'm just curious. That's just one example, but I'm curious how, how you think maybe uh, Gutekunst has his, maybe his thinking about for this next season has changed because I feel like it has to have to see what we saw out of this team. This team doesn't have to be perfect going into next year, but it needs to be able to win. I mean, like if the offense heats up again, you can't have neglected the other sides of the ball or other parts of this team to the point where it's going to cost us a championship. You've got to give, I think, if you're good because you've got to have this team at least be capable of hanging in there if this thing goes, if they get on a heater, you know, you've got to be able to win it. Um, so just curious what you think that might be. All right. Talk to you later. So I don't, I don't necessarily think so. And, and there's a lot of gray area in terms of what specifically we're talking about, but I don't think we're going back to this sort of all in strategy. I mean, to be completely honest, they were able to compete last year, 2023. Um, they should have beat the 49ers. We should be in the Super Bowl um, with a very real chance of beating the Chiefs. So there isn't sort of this, I think, feeling of, um, you know, we have a window and we cannot compete unless we have this. Like we've got a strict three-year window left with Jordan Love and um, we just can't compete without a safety. So we have to push money out and do that kind of stuff so that we can make room to go out and get, you know, Cameron Curl or something stupid. Um, I just don't think that's going to necessarily be a thing. I think they're going to try to get back to the old school draft and develop. And uh, that's not to say they're not going to be active in free agency, but they're not going to be reckless. And I think one of the biggest ways is through contracts. Um, they're going to stagger them so that, you know, the price goes up as time goes on. And he's already talked about like, you, to some degree, if you want to compete in the NFL, you have to do that. But I don't think they're going to be wild and reckless. Um, and I don't know that there's anything wild and reckless to do. I'm looking at the available safeties. You got Antoine Winfield. No way they let him go. Uh, Kyle Duggar, uh, same situation, almost for sure. They're going to be slapping a franchise tag on him for $16 million, and then Cameron Curl would be the next one. Um, and uh, I, I don't know the plan. I'm I'm guessing you know they're, they're talking about potential franchise tag candidate. That seems strong, but either way, I don't know that you let these guys go. I mean, I don't, I don't know why, like, Xavier McKinney, would they let him go? And if they do, you're going to let this guy walk out the door after his rookie contract. I mean, that's not like a massive move for the Green Bay Packers. I mean, he can't be, he can't be that good. So I don't know. I mean, you know, and then aside from that, Xavier McKinney is Geno Stone. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't think there are a ton of options at safety. I think most of the big names are going to be taken. Now that's still, you still have to bring into question guys that are not technically free agents, but are potential cap casualties. And I don't know. I don't know. But I just think, and and, and Gutekunst explicitly said it, like, are you going to try to get your cap cleaned up? The answer was yes. In other words, we're going to stop being reckless. There's going to be some, you know, moving monies around to be competitive, but really no more than everybody else is doing. And um, we're going to try to get away from what we were doing when Rodgers was here, when we were pushing all the money out so we can go get everybody and just be kind of wild and crazy because we have this really small window that we feel we need to maximize. Hey, Pat Daddy. Hey. Uh, just finished watching uh, YouTube, uh, Jake Shavink's, um analysis of viewers and followers that submitted their uh, mock drafts. Sure. And one of mine was used in that, and he had, uh, he was a, he, I guess the description he used was intrigued because there was a couple guys I had picked that I thought maybe, uh, would be on the radar for Green Bay because of our DC's, uh, history with Ohio State. And I'm not quite sure if he was there long enough to perhaps recruit this guy, but, Maybe I thought you would look into uh, Eigenrock, the linebacker out of Ohio State, and maybe that he will fit our system. Um, the other guys, I believe that Green Bay will go. All right, let's pause for one second here. got to find who you're talking about. Um, let's see, you're talking about Eichenberg, Tommy Eichenberg? 
linebacker out of Ohio State. So I haven't looked at any linebackers yet. So Tommy Eichenberg, when was he even there? Yeah, so there, there's a vague connection. He was there in 2019. Um, he didn't really start until 2021. I don't know. I don't know how much that plays into it, to be honest. I mean, it's it's uh, and you know, you mentioned connections, so it would be a question of you know, halfly calling back to Ohio State and talking to people about guys. I think, I think maybe that does raise the chances that somebody like that comes, only because. You know, again, none of this is a guarantee. You, know, you look at it and say, that shouldn't matter. You just grab the best player. Well, the best player is based on, you know, again, there is no 100%. You, the, the maximum amount of information you're going to get on these guys, let's just pretend, is 50%. When you have sources inside the building, they can fill in some of the gaps on players that maybe some of these other, um, you, you can't get with some of these other guys. And so if they can clear up some of that with a guy like Tommy Eichenberg, based on his own personal experience and what some of the guys in the building are saying, you can feel a little bit more comfortable about Eichenberg than you do maybe about, you know, the next guy on your board, you know, Ty Keith Smith, the safety out of Georgia or something. You're, you're, you're torn between the two and you've got a little bit of inside information that Eichenberg is a really good dude and he's a great locker room guy. And so you pull the trigger on Eichenberg. Now, obviously they have some level of sources with Ty Keith Smith, but maybe there's closer sources. I don't really know. I would guess that it's somewhat marginal, but, but there is that slight extra bit to it. Um, and then there's also a chance, and again, he didn't play much when Halfley was there, but it's possible they know each other quite well. Maybe he remembers him as a, as a really talented up and coming guy, you know, and because of his ties, he watched Ohio state closely. And so he was really interested in Eichenberg and really feels like he could fit the system and all that. I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I'm kind of just making stuff up, but I, I, I guess I would just say that it's, it's unlikely to move the needle much, but probably moves it a little bit. And then uh, the other guys you're talking about will probably be um, some of the blue chip defensive backs like Quinion Mitchell. Mm-hmm. Um, perhaps I, I think Cooper DeGene will be long gone. Maybe they'll move up and get him if they really want him. But um, perhaps uh, double dipping with uh, Newvin and Kitchens or maybe the safety out of uh, Missouri. But um I'm pretty confident with uh, them doing more man, like the Jets, that they're going to go for the best defensive backs that are out there in safeties and perhaps uh, sure up that linebacker uh, room a little bit. Um, but overall, I, I think after listening more and more how uh, Halfley works, I believe that uh, we're in for a very, very defensive uh, heavy draft and maybe scatter in a couple of offensive players or offensive linemen like uh, maybe BB out of uh, Kansas or, you know, maybe that offensive uh, center for Florida that we might be able to get them in maybe the fifth or sixth round. So who knows? Who knows? But uh, I know the Brooks, the, line, the running back for Texas is moving up in the mock drafts mm-hmm. for Green Bay. So we'll see, but it's going to be an interesting couple of months doing a lot of mock drafts till we're blue in the face, but uh, thought I'd throw those few names out there because I really would like you to maybe do a little bit of uh, commentary on uh, Eigenrock as a linebacker. As we know, they always like to pick guys that uh, we don't even have on our boards, except maybe every once in a while we get a long shot and, and get one right. So I'm out. So. I, I haven't gotten to linebackers, and I'm, I'm not going to go watch him right now, but I will say he fits the prototype of what the Packers did a lot last year, which is guys that had a big drop-off but had a great year the year prior. So he had a big breakout. So his first year was 2021. He had a 64 grade. 2022 is his big breakout. 87 PFF grade, 90 run defense, 81 tackling, 73 pass rush, 76 coverage, just dominant across the board. And then he dropped back off. Um, are there injuries? It looks like there probably were. Uh, he didn't play week 5, 11, 12. So I don't know what happened in those situations, if there's an injury concern or some other kind of a concern. But, you know, there were a lot of guys that you go back and watch, and it's like, this guy's not very good. And it's like, oh, you got to watch his 2022 tape. Um, but aside from that, I mean, 6'2", 240. Seems to be more of a run defender than a cover guy. His coverage has actually been pretty terrible, aside from that one good year. 
Um, run defense has been pretty solid throughout, along with tackling. So I don't know. I don't really know uh, what the plan is. I, I have such a hard time. I, as you were talking, I'm looking at all this stuff, and I'm surprised, actually. Um, Jonathan Brooks is just outside of the second round. I'm surprised he's that far out. But, man, everything you look at is like, I could see it, but I also could see us not. You know, with, you know, cornerbacks. It's like, I don't know, man. Maybe they, I mean, if they like Stokes and Jair, what's the plan? What's the plan with Quinion Mitchell? Or do do we just move Jair to the slot officially? Like, it's just done? Um, Maybe. You know, and maybe it becomes like a Jair and Quinion Mitchell, and then when you go out with three guys, then Jair comes inside, and, you know, that kind of a thing. I don't know. Um, I like Jerzon Newton and he's fallen into our range and maybe he'll even fall back a little bit further, but I like Jerzon Newton, but do we have enough of these one gapping interior? You know, we just got Wyatt and, you know, Kenny's going to be that role now. And I think he can handle that. And I don't know about Brooks and Wooden, maybe somebody goes outside and, 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 uh, Jerzon can stay inside. Maybe they both do. I, I, I just, I don't know. You know, you look at the tackles, there's a lot of tackles in that range and I, I, I get it, but are are they happy with their tackles? And they're like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not going with uh, uh, Fontenot or whatever. You know, wide receiver. Are, are we going to go wide receiver or are we kind of good with what we got? And so you just kind of have to come back to, again, like they're going to take best player available and they're just going to figure it out from there. Um, and I, I will say, though, aside from if, if you just kind of let go of the whole worrying about what our roster is and, you know, you know we're not going to draft them because we already have that, just leave that aside. If there's one guy that I really, really like, and it, I, I haven't even watched him yet, but just based on Senior Bowl, you know, what, what he was able to do there and the way that he plays, Quinion Mitchell is just, he gets me real excited. I love Cooper DeJean. I love Jerzon Newton. They're actually 18, 19, and 20 on the big board. I am big fans of all three of those guys. Plenty of wide receivers that I like. And man, if we could package those, those two thirds and go get my running back, I would be beyond excited. Or don't even package him. Just, just get him. If he falls to us in the third and we get him, I'm just going to lose my freaking mind. I'm not going to be able to contain myself. But I'm excited, man. I mean, I, again, I've barely dipped my toe in this, and there are already guys. I mean, I, I feel like last year I struggled to find guys that I really, really liked. Um, and I, I, I do have to look closer. Like I, the only guy that I've mentioned that I've really like officially watched since I've gone through and done all that is is Cooper DeGene, and. Um, and uh, what's his name? The the running back, uh, Jonathan Brooks. Although Ray Davis and Dylan Lauby, who are right next to each other, one twenty seven and one twenty eight. Man, either one of those guys, I'd be so excited. I just can't hide it. But anyways, I'm gonna leave you guys with that. Uh, make sure you get your calls in. We've only got four left, so not enough for a show at this point. You guys have a good rest of your night. I will talk to you later. Have a good one. Bye bye. 